Hi, my name is Jimmy Lin. I'm the Chairman Chair in the Chairman School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. I'm also the co-director of the Waterloo Artificial Intelligence Institute. And today, I'm going to tell you why you should care about data. What is artificial intelligence, or AI? No doubt you've heard about it. Now, AI is one of those things if you ask 10 scientists to define, you'll get 11 different answers. Generally, AI refers to smart machines that encompass everything from self-driving cars, chess-playing programs, intelligent uh, voice assistants on your phone, to algorithms that determine if you get a loan or not. It's not an exaggeration to say that AI is now interwoven into the fabric of our society. If you look around, there's not a sector of the economy that hasn't already been transformed by AI. Financial services, technology, healthcare, manufacturing, you name it. As computer scientists, we have this phrase called garbage in, garbage out. So if you feed bad data into a model, of course you're gonna get bad quality predictions. Now, of course, there are always gonna be data quality issues. Somebody mistyped your name, there was a glitch in the sensor when the data was being gathered, or uh, something got corrupted in the export. But there are more insidious issues. So for example, if your data captures systemic biases, such as racial disparities, well, then you've got yourself a racist algorithm. Now, as AI are being integrated into more high-stakes applications, this becomes a pressing issue. Recently, doctors discover that a prototype AI system had problems diagnosing skin cancer on darker skin patients. Why? Because they didn't gather a complete set of data drawing from people with different skin tones. At the Waterloo Artificial Intelligence Institute, we care about this entire gamut of issues, from data to decisions. Of course, we are driven by foundational scientific challenges. And more importantly, we're committed to the responsible deployment of AI technologies because that's what's gonna to lead to a more prosperous future for all of us. And that's why you should care about data. Everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Nidoni Donaldson, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement at the University of Waterloo. And I'm very pleased to be here to MC tonight's event. First, I would like to start by doing our territorial land acknowledgement. I appreciate that we are joining together from various locations, so I personally acknowledge that the land in which I work, live, and play on is on the Haldeman Tract the land granted to the Haudenosaunee of Six Nations by the Haldeman Treaty of 1784. The land inside and surrounding the Haldeman Tract is the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples, which includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. I also recognize this area is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. These acknowledgements are just one small step, and the university's active work toward reconciliation takes pl place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, such as this event, and is centralized within our Office of Indigenous Relations. So again, I'd like to welcome everyone and extend a warm welcome to you, and thank you for coming out and for joining us for this, this evening's presentation, Data Plus the Arts. It's the third in our four-part four series that explores the role of data in our digitally driven world. This series is a true collaboration, and Alumni Relations is honored to host the event tonight in partnership with the Faculty of Mathematics. Tonight's event is, part of our, is also part of our annual Black and Gold Day programming, which, with a whole suite of programming through Saturday. There's also still time to register uh, for the Warriors VIP tent, the alumni VIP tent, we'd love to see you there. The kickoff is 1 p.m. on Saturday. And so as we carefully become accustomed to meeting and gathering once again in person, I would like to thank you for joining us in person here in Math 3, and also to welcome the many alumni joining us virtually. As alumni and friends of the university, you are so important to our community, and it is events such as this one that can bring us together. To engage, stay connected, to each other and to the University of Waterloo. So a few housekeeping notes. 
Throughout the panel discussion, I invite you to submit your questions through Mentimeter. Using your cell phones, you can go to menti.com, so M-E-T-I.com, and for online guests, you'll see the QR code on your screen that you can scan with your phones. For our in-person audience, there's a QR code on the note cards at your seat. We will work to respond to as many questions as possible following the panel's discussion. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce the Dean of Mathematics, Mark Giesbrecht. Mark is the 12th Dean of the University of Waterloo of Mathematics. Um, and earlier in his career, he did attend some other universities and he also worked at some of them as well as at IBM. However, he did join us in, in 2001. So I think he's got his allegiance in, in line now. Um, he's a skilled and respected teacher having taught many courses over the course of his time at Waterloo. Uh, he was also the director of the undergraduate studies for the faculty of math from 2002 to 2005. And from 2014 to 2020, he was the director of the David R. Sheridan School of Computer Science. In July 2020, Mark became the dean of the faculty of math, so one of those pandemic deans. <laughs> um, and I don't think anyone has looked back since. We're very proud to have you here tonight with us, uh, Mark, and I'll welcome you now to the stage. Thank you, Nanoni, for that uh, warm introduction. And, and welcome uh, to all students, faculty, alumni, and friends joining us today. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to take part in today's event. Uh, this is the third of our four-part series, uh, Data Plus um, event series. And, and unfortunately, this is the, the first one I've, I've actually been in town and available to, uh, to attend. So I'm, I'm particularly excited about this. Our world is generating data at an incredible pace. Believe it or not, we, we create roughly 2.5 quintillion, and that's a one with 18 zeros after it, bytes of data, that's eight ones or zeros, every single day. Um, this data can be tremendously useful and even revolutionary. Some people compare the advent of big data to the invention of the microscope in the, in the 16th century. Just as the microscope, microscope made previously invisible processes observable for the first time, and opened up a whole new world of microbiology, uh, microbiology. Data, when effectively analyzed, can yield powerful insights into the world around us. And it's just, just as with high magnification, it also reveals an awful lot of noise. And data and data analysis is essential in improving our health care. During the pandemic, it was harnessed to predict diseases, quickly detect new variants, identify effective medicines, including vaccines, and organize massive public health initiatives. Data can also enhance our picture of how climate is changing, enable us to create more accurate models of our climate and ecosystem, and helping us model things like reforestation, fertilizer use, or extreme weather events. And data is transforming every sphere of human life. It is changing the way we run our economy, produce consumer goods, organize democracies, for better or for worse, and as we will see today, create art. Tonight is tonight's is perhaps the most surprising topic for some of us. There's a percep public perception that art and mathematics have little in common, even that they are diametrically opposed. Yet when we look at history, we see that art and mathematics have been intertwined since the beginning. To cite just a few examples, Renaissance papers studied projective geometries to create the illusion of depth. Artists and architects proportioned their works according to the golden ratio. And 20th century pa painters like M.C. Escher famously explored hyperbolic geometry in his work. Now conversely, and perhaps closer to my heart, mathemat mathematicians are driven as much by the beauty of their constructions as by their utility. And perhaps this is the surprising part for some of us. G.H. Hardy, one of the 20th century's most famous mathematicians declared in his Mathematician's Apology, the mathematics, math mathematicians' patterns, like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. The ideas, like colors or words, must fit together in a harmonious way. Beauty is the first test. There is no permanence in this world for ugly mathematics. Uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful, the Mathematician's Apology was written in the 1930s. It's a really wonderful book about sort of getting inside the, the head of a mathematician and, and the motivation. A and I have to say, as much as Hardy 
relished the idea that mathematics was not useful or not harmful. His mathematics is actually at the heart of the security um, of, of, of your, your cell phone and your banking. So keep that in mind when we talk about useless mathematics. In each event so far, we've heard from the subject matter experts working in the labs, the companies and communities driving change with data. All the speakers have some connection to the University of Waterloo. This is no surprise. Waterloo is home to some exceptional expertise in data analytics. We at the university view ourselves as leaders in the data revolution as much as, ma as, much as the mathematical revolu revolution. And, you know, and frankly, as the dean of mathematics, but I think, you know, speaking for most of the faculty, we see these as almost one and the same. We have talented people working at every stage of that data pipeline, from data cleaning and management to security and privacy to modeling and analysis to visualization and to art creation. The faculty, the Faculty of Mathematics, is unique in bringing together the three disciplines necessary for data science, mathematics, statistics, and computer science. But there are brilliant researchers and students in every faculty at the University of Waterloo who are using data to achieve positive outcomes, including several from the Faculty of Arts, who you're going to meet shortly. And then there, of course, are our alumni and friends. Many of you are leaders in the data revolution, too, spearheading innovative data-driven innov innovations in your workplaces and communities. If nothing else, I hope this event series sparks us to think about how we can best collaborate to further data analytics and improve the world. So without further ado, let me introduce the moder of moderator of today's panel, Craig Kaplan. So Craig is one of my favorite professors in computer science, associate professor um, in, in, um, in graphics and in art. He's interested in a broad range of interdisciplinary topics with a particular focus on interactions between mathematics and art. He uses mathematical ideals, ideas to create tools and algorithms that generate ornamental patterns or that empower artists and engineers. He frequently incorporates knowledge from computer graphics, classical and computational geometry, human interact, human computer interaction, graph theory, symmetry, and tiling, and per perceptual psychology. I know he draws on many classical forms of art from across the world, and some of his designs have been featured and are part of the architecture of the National Museum of Mathematics in New York City. He's an associate editor and past editor-in-chief of the Journal of Mathematics and the Arts and a member of the board of the Bridges Organization, which oversees the annual conference on mathematics and art. So with that, I give you Professor Craig Kaplan. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, you are likewise my favorite Dean of Mathematics at the University of Waterloo, so I appreciate that. Yeah, absolute favorite. Uh, we, we, a few of us, did a significant amount of teaching already today, so I hope you'll indulge us, uh, allowing us to, to take a seat. So thank you all for coming, and, and good evening. Um, this is going to be primarily a uh, uh, an informal conversation about our beliefs about the way that uh, data and the arts interact and intersect. So uh, let me just offer some introductory remarks first. My name is Craig Kaplan. I am an alumni of the University of Waterloo. I received my, uh, my bachelor's of mathematics here in 1996. So I'm particularly pleased to be here uh, at an event that is hosted by the Alumni Association and uh, to talk about this topic, which is close to my heart as someone who's interested in the intersections between mathematics and the arts. In fact, I, it's great that you brought up some of those topics because um, as it happens right now, I'm reading a book about the birth of projective geometry in the Italian Renaissance. So um, like Musaccio and Brunelleschi and how that, how that developed into what we now use day to day in mathematics. Um, but let's focus on data. So as Mark said, we are constantly awash in a sea of data, more data than we can possibly comprehend. As he said, we, every day the human race generates 18 bazillion bytes of data, who knows how much actually. Uh, and it's very hard to get our heads around all of that. Certainly, uh, here where we do data science, we invent mathematical and computational tools that help. So uh, 
data science is partly about being able to make sense of those raw numbers in a meaningful way by constructing visualizations, graphs, uh, uh, you know, charts, and also just tables and trying to build statistical summaries of large volumes of data. But another tool that we can use to make sense of data, of course, is art. Um, art helps us make sense of the world in a different way, but a very important way. It, it can inspire us and provoke us and move us to think a certain way and to act a certain way in a way that uh, raw data not, can't necessarily do. It can really engage with us at a deep emotional and intuitive level. And that's one of the reasons I, I love the topic of art and mathematics together. Uh, so, you know, art can intersect with data in a few different ways. Uh, sometimes data is just a raw source of randomness that an artist might use to drive their process in order to gain some unpredictability. And uh, an example that I like of that is Mozart, who invented a game where he would roll dice to pick little fragments of melody that he would then use as a basis for composing. And, you know, sometimes the data itself matters in the creation of the art we end up with. Uh, and you may have seen online examples of this, one that I like recent. I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell you exactly where I saw this, but easy to find. People who knit scarves, for example, where every row of the scarf represents a day's worth of climate data wherever they happen to live. So maybe you change the color depending on the temperature that day. Uh, so that's, that's really today's theme. Let me just constrain it a little bit, but with some ground rules, not ground rules, we talk about whatever we want, but just some, uh, some thoughts on what we might not visit today that you might be expecting. First of all, we decided well, we don't want to use this opportunity to try to define art. That's, that's maybe, yeah, that's a lifetime's worth of work by a lot of people we will instead adopt a broad and inclusive view of what art is and not try to question uh, and litigate each piece that we see uh, as to whether it constitutes art. The other thing we want to point out is um, there's a lot of new art that you will have seen even in the past few months that is generated by AI, right, by artificial intelligence. Uh, names like Stable Diffusion and DALI 2 and Imogen and um, and a few other tools that are being pioneered by, uh, by AI companies generating art using deep learning techniques. It's a fascinating topic and we all love it, but it's also its own topic that deserves its own treatment outside of uh, what we're gonna talk about today. So we might touch on that in passing, but that's about as far as we'll go. Now with that, um, and because of the slightly unusual topic, I'm going to introduce the panelists, but I'm more than that, I want to give them a lot of uh, time and opportunity to say more about themselves and their own work and its relationship to data. So we'll, every, each of them will take a few minutes. That's why I haven't introduced them yet. They're not just going to sit here listening to me all night. Um, each of them will take a few minutes to introduce themselves and show you a little bit of their work so you can see what their relationship is to this topic. So that first, and I'll, I, I won't, um, I won't give you a complete bio. I won't perform their CVs as one might usually do. I'll just say a few words about each of them to introduce them. First of all, I'd like to introduce Rob Gorbett, who's right here on my left. Uh, Rob is an artist and engineer. He's a professor and chair of the Knowledge Integration Program in the Faculty of Environment here at the university. And he, uh, to the extent that this is an alumni event, he wins as the alumniist having received all of his degrees here at the university. And I'll allow, uh, yeah, well done. Yeah, you get the prize. And I'll let Rob tell you more about himself. Okay, now do you want me to, should I go up there? Or should I, I, I you own? know, I'm, I'm gonna sit. My notes are up here, so I'm just gonna oh, grab okay. my notes. <laughs> See, I thought I was being smart, and somebody's probably stolen them, which isn't gonna be, there we go. Um, I'll sit, but I do have the advancer thing, uh, the magic advancer. Um, so if I push this, yes, okay. So thank you, Craig, um, and uh, thanks to the Alumni Association for inviting us. Um, I'm excited about the talk tonight. My name is Rob Gorbin, and as Craig said, I'm an engineer. I got my undergrad and master's and PhD all from Waterloo, um, and in, I was hired as a faculty member in 2000. In 2002, I got the opportunity to start working with artists and architects integrating technology into their creative works. Um, and that was really a direction shift for me, which is a long story, so I won't belabor it. But 
I want to start by talking about uh, some of the work that I've done with Philip Beasley and the Living Architecture Systems Group. So this is a research group at the University of Waterloo that asks the questions related to the future of buildings and the future of our relationship with buildings. Um, and we do that by constructing ever more complex, immersive sculptural environments that we install and open to the public. So it's, it's their research labs, their sculptures, they're in the wild test beds um, all at the same time. And the one that's on screen right now is uh, Hylozoic Ground. It was installed in the Venice Biennale. We were selected to represent Canada at the Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2010. Um, and that was a relatively early piece from my collaboration with Philip. It used um, pretty dumb local sensing to detect where people were in the room. And in response to their presence, so in response to the data that their presence would trigger, um, it would react. And so we used advanced materials to create a nice organic response. And one of the really interesting things to come out of that piece is that people, the visitors anthropomorphized the piece. Um, so that's early work. And then later on, this is uh, Amatria, which is installed at a partner university, Indiana University in Bloomington. Uh, it's a much larger piece. It starts to integrate sound, still has relatively crude sensing. Um, but has a central control system that's using reinforcement learning, a form of, of machine learning, AI, to uh, try to generate behaviors that are interesting to the visitors, as measured by the amount of time that they will spend in front of a particular sensor at a particular spot. Uh, this is also being conceived as an open API installation, so local researchers can sort of plug their algorithms in and see how they work. So both sculpture and testbed. Um, this is another local piece uh, down in Cambridge, so just south of here in a, a private event hall called Tapestry Hall. Uh, it's called Meander, and part of the reason I, I uh, feature it here is that we've started now to integrate uh, crude two-dimensional infrared sensing. So we're gathering more complex data. We can detect movements and motions now um, and respond to those. Um, this, uh, there's a video that's going to play. It's about a minute long. Um, this video I chose, uh, it's a piece that we installed last November in a private collector's uh, home in um, Brittany in northwest France. Um, this piece I selected because it doesn't actually have sensors in it, um, but it is using a Perlin noise simulation, which is a form of data, um, to model uh, a cloud cover. And the cloud cover, the simulated cloud cover, is tri what's triggering the lights and the behavior in the sculpture. So this is yet another sort of form of data um, that is influencing the behavior of the art. And you can see uh, from this work, there's, there's um, all of the pieces are laser cut um, and extruded and sort of, so there's a lot of types of data that go into making this, not what we would call necessarily call big data, but data nonetheless. Um, this is another piece that is in Cambridge, just south of uh, the city. Uh, it's called Solar Collector. This is not my work with Philip. This is work with my brother, Matt Gorbett, and sister-in-law, Susan Gorbett, who are together, we are Gorbett Design. Um, and it's interesting to hear Mark talk about uh, the golden spiral and the golden ratio, because this piece actually uses, I would say, different forms of data. Um, it's inspired by the sun. Um, and actually, quite accidentally, we thought to ourselves, it's a solar-powered piece, and we set ourselves the goal, there are 12 shafts, and we set ourselves the computation, what length would the shafts have to be and what angle would they need to be to collect an equal amount of sunlight at the various times of the year between the summer equinox and the winter solstice, or the winter equinox. And so the tall shaft is what we call the winter shaft. It aims lower in the sky, and the short shaft is the summer shaft, is more insulation and it points up into the sky. And the result was this kind of beautiful form. And it's, it's really, it's the data of nature. Um, at the same time, there's an interface that uh, users from around the world can access and uh, create patterns. So we're gathering that kind of data. Um, they submit the patterns, and then when night falls, the solar energy that was collected during the day, stored in batteries within the shafts, comes alive and their patterns play in a nightly show. Um, so lots of different kinds of data here. Um, I mentioned the golden spiral. So the one piece of the geometry that wasn't developed sort of by the sun, we knew the lengths and the angles of the shaft, 
and we selected the golden ratio and golden spiral to lay out the, the, the form. Um, generated a lot of community from around the world, so these are just uh, submissions from all over the world. Um, people felt a real sense of belonging to the piece. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I look forward to the conversation and to talking about how we use data in our art. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. I will uh, hand the token over. No, we, I, I'll, uh, let's, let's go to you next, so hang on to that clicker. Um, okay, that was great. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jane Tingley. Jane is an artist and curator. She's also a professor in the Department of Computational Arts at York University which is a department name of which I am very jealous because it sounds, it just sounds great. Uh, but formerly, I will say, a professor here at the University of Waterloo, both at the Waterloo and the Stratford campuses until just a couple of years ago. Uh, so definitely a connection to the University of Waterloo and we're, we're very pleased to have her back visiting us. And Jane, why don't you uh, say more about yourself? Are we gonna get this over here? It's the wrong person. Oh, that's why, you that's why you were gonna hand it off. Is it possible to switch over to Jane's slides and? Uh, no, it's just that it's on, this one's not, the slides aren't on this one. Is that? That's my slide. Is that better? Yeah, yeah okay. but they're not on this. Oh, they're, no, you just, no, okay, yeah, okay. that's, that's the Q&A. I just can't uh, see the time, so I might go over. <laughs> I practice. <laughs> uh, so hi, I'm Jane. Um, yeah, just a bit of background as well. Um, I just have to say, I went to the uh, biennial, the architectural biennial, and that piece blew my in mind 2010. in 2010. Wow. Yeah, I did the whole, I didn't know any, I didn't know you at that time, and wow. the thing touched me, and I was just like blown away. I was just like, wow, this thing is the most extraordinary thing. So I just, Not just emotionally, but it, just, it actually like, literally reached touched, out and, It touched yeah, my leg. It, like, I, it was, it like, a little, it was would, like a little yeah, feather that yeah, just yeah. went bloop, and I was like, wow. Yeah. I just, I don't know, it was a great <laughs> version of like moving, and I just loved it. Anyway, um, yeah, so I have a, a fine arts background. Um, I didn't work with technology until 20, uh, 2003, and so I started learning at that time. And so I have, I worked as, a inter I ma made responsive installation, eventually went into interactive installation, and then I've been working with games, and most recently I've been working with data. So I, I'm kind of focusing on one body of work because it's the most exciting thing for me right now. Um, so I'm gonna introduce a, a piece called Forest Inclusive. Uh, which is an umbrella project that uh, is looking at ways to reimagine our relationship to the natural world through the creation of a networked sculptural hub. Oh yeah, I forgot about this, sorry. Network sculptural hubs, as well as, uh, like, which is a sensing system and the creation of a number of um, immersive experiential artworks. And so the sensor hub, there's a bunch of them and they're made out of cork and they all basically, they're different types of sensors. So we have soil sensors, we have atmosphere sensors and we have air sensors. Um, did it switch? There it is. Um, and so this is just sort of looking under the hood and so you can see they're just a number of sort of low cost environmental sensors. They're all sensing, they're reading the world in real time and then they're sending data to the internet, the big, big internet. And so then I take these, these hubs, which are made out of cork, so they're, they're pretty much weatherproof, and I install them onto trees. And so I've been putting them in different locations. Um, this is at the Hearst Monsu Castle, and it's thanks to my connections with the partnership, uh, uh, par partnership grant called Environments of Change that actually is running out of this university. Uh, Dr. Stephen Bednarski is the PI. Um, and so we put them at Hearst Monceau, and I'm actually gonna be doing a uh, permanent installation there next summer. And currently they're up at the Rare Charitable Reserve. And so you can see that they're on different trees and they're just generally, and so I, they send, send data once an hour to once every second, depending on which type of sensor they are. And so they send the data, live data, and this is the uh, Internet of Things uh, prototyping platform that I use called Shifter. And so that data just goes, uh, you can see the little black balls, that's pretty much packets that are getting sent to the big, big Internet. And then you can see the numbers on the side um, changing as those numbers are getting collected. And so I can gather this, um, I've even been able to save the data so I can keep up to 24 hours of information. Um, and so then with this, this sort of sensing infrastructure, I'm creating a number of artworks. And I've also got students creating artworks using this information because I'm really interested in how we can create embodied experiences, how we can shift how we think about the natural world and, and like the more than human other, I guess is what I'm calling it. 
Uh, so this is, funny enough, was, uh, a, this is just a prototype. It's gonna be totally rebuilt, but this piece is uh, an incubator that actually some engineer students, thanks to Robert who uh, got me connected with them, some engineer students who wanted to use this as a fourth year project. And so this, this, re this piece is sort of inspired by the research that has proven that trees actually take care of each other through uh, sharing nutrients through their root systems. And so my question here was, how might a tree take care of, say, a seedling to be transplanted into itself, I guess? Like, how, how, might, a, how might a forest care for a plant that's meant to be transplanted? How might it harden it off? So this, um, and so this is basically an incubator, and it basically has the same environmental conditions inside the incubator as exists in the forest. So when it rains, it rains. When it's warm, it's warm. When it's windy, it's windy. Um, and so this is just a piece that I'm still building and I don't know where it's gonna go, uh, but it's a work in progress. But the thing that I'm mostly gonna focus on is this visualization that I'm working on. This is an early prototype from 2020. Um, and so here my, is my sensing hub and then a first attempt at visualizing all the data that came from the hub. Um, I also showed it the Kafka Biennial in 2021, except it's supposed to be an immersive installation, but I had to do it in a window display, so it was a little bit different. Um, but this is ultimately where we're at right now, um, and I've done quite a bit of work. So you see there's a large visualization, and on the left you can see there's a point cloud, and then there's a uh, cork interface. Oops, sorry, there we go. Um, and so this shows you a point cloud. So a point cloud is a bunch of, it's like, a, it comes from a LiDAR scan. Uh, the person who did this was with a very large drone at Rare, um, which has a LiDAR scan that actually scans um, the forest, and the person who did it was Dr. Derek Robinson, who's in the geology department. And so a point cloud is a bunch of points, it's a bunch of data that sort of represents, and it's basically a photograph, but it shows you all the different levels of, of the forest. And so here we're just affecting it in real time using the shifter data, and so you can see that things are changing, you can see the tree is moving, um, and so this is just moving in real time, just as a way of visualizing. Um, but the real thing, this is the visualization, and so this one actually encompasses all of the data that's in the piece, and there's 24 rows, and so each row has atmospheric and particulate matter. It, it basically is a visualization of 24 hours of a tree's life. But the visualization is also interactive, so you can uh, use your hand and move through the visualization and inspect the 24 hours of a tree's life. But the problem is, like, if you move really fast, then you're just going to shoot through the tree's experience. But if you try to hold yourself as slow as moving as possible, as still as possible, you can actually experience one of the hours and look at all the pieces that are. So you can see pollen, and you can see light, and all the different things. And then finally, um, this is somebody just sort of play testing, and you can see them sort of holding their hand as they're trying to move into the experience of this tree. Um, and of course, I was using tree rings sort of as the visual metaphor that I was interested in. And then on the left side, I have an interface, which is actually a scent sculpture, uh, which has an ionizer and geosmin and water. So geosmin is the smell of a forest after it rains. So every time it rains in the forest, an ionizer turns on and then a fan blows it out into the room and so that you smell. I was trying to think of the word, like is it when you visualize visuals, but olfactorize? Yeah, yeah. Really? So okay, so I olfactorized. <laughs> <laughs> the, the scent of a forest. Yeah, it makes I just made it up. Perfect sense. I've coined it. You heard it here first. Yep. It's, yes, so it's the TM. smell of vision of the forest. <laughs> Anyways, that's that. Thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot, Jade. Can we can we rewind now? Yeah, go back to uh, tech for good. So uh, that was wonderful. So that the uh, can I still go see those those sensors at rare? They're up. I'm actually deinstalling tomorrow. I'm, oh. I'm really well. Actually, it's not really. <laughs> It's, it's there, it's just um, I've had them hidden and it's not for okay. people. Okay, so I shouldn't expect to walk down the trail and see no, them No, you can't see them. Okay. That's but really I've great. been really proud of myself. They've been running for six weeks straight. Wow. And yeah. I don't know how I managed, but yeah, that's, that's on one set of batteries. an engineering marvel Impressive. to be sure, yeah. yeah. Get anything to run I'm like Wiggly. Yeah. That's, that's great. Uh, so, okay, finally, uh, it's my pleasure then to introduce uh, Marcelo Gorman, who's uh, sitting at the end there, Marcel is also an artist and a professor here at the University of Waterloo in the English department. And he's also, very importantly, the director of the Critical Media Lab, which is uh, an interdisciplinary new media space uh, here at the university that is focused on the interaction between technology and human experience. So, uh, Marcel, why don't you say a bit more about yourself? Yeah, thank you, Craig, and thanks for having me here tonight. 
you just saw a lot of beautiful images and imagery, and I'm not, my work isn't beautiful. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of ugly math, and um, <laughs> I, I'm not a, a technology artist. I make art about technology, and uh, I'm not a carpenter, I'm a crapenter. So <laughs> when you look at these images, it's what you're gonna see. But um, primarily my, my work most recently is in, is, is in, can I go back, in this area. So I helped write this declaration with uh, Communitech and Deloitte and the Rideau Foundation called the Tech for Good Declaration. And my lab is actually in the Communitech hub and it's there to uh, create a presence, a space where people can think critically about technology and reflect on the impacts of technology on society. Um, so we wrote this declaration and you'll notice um, that the very first one is actually about data and it's about trust as a primary uh, concern regarding how to deal with technology in a responsible way, how to design technology in a responsible way. More recently, I mean, maybe in being redundant, we, were, we call this responsible innovation. So it's encouraging designers of technology to basically take responsibility for the things they're designing. And we heard a little bit about racist algorithms, for example. Well, racist data sets that go into algorithms, let's be more precise. Um, but this is something that we're trying to do through research, and I have a, a PhD student here tonight who's working on this, trying to get more students who are students who will develop technologies to take this seriously. So when they have to do a design project, a capstone project, they're going to think about the potential impacts about this. Are they being inclusive? Who are they leaving out? Uh, what, are the, what are the potential toxicities of their project? In addition to, of course, its benefits for humanity, and I'll get to humanity in a second. Uh, in addition to this kind of policy work that I do, I also do a lot of outreach. So this is a school, a, a class of students at St. Mary's High School. And what you're seeing up top there is resistor case. And it's a small pouch that these students make themselves with kits that, um, I, that we give to them. I designed these kits with some of my own students in the lab. And the kit is basically to create a pouch with a very loud Velcro enclosure they put their phone in in the classroom. They make it themselves, so they take ownership of it. They experience you know, self-determination with their phones instead of a top-down teacher saying, lock away your devices. They make the case themselves, and then if they want to access their phone, they have to make a loud noise and deal with the consequences of that. And so we use uh, fabric made from recycled water bottles. This is an object to think with, an object lesson for the students. And as we're giving these workshops, we talk to them about data gathering, about proprietary data gathering from social media sites that they're on and how they're being tracked and how their data is being sold and used to target messages to them, which is a huge issue in terms of data gathering from adolescents and then that data being targeted, put, thrown back at them in the form of ads or messaging that makes them feel self-conscious or motivates them to uh, do things they probably wouldn't otherwise do or want to do. So there, uh, I love this photo because there's a Band-Aid on the, my research <laughs> oh assistant's <yeah>. finger. <laughs> that didn't happen in the making of this case, but it does require <laughs> using hammers to make the case. So for a lot of these students, we teach the first time they're using a hammer. Wow. Um, whoop, this one, hopefully this works yeah, now. The red one goes back. I might have to do one more. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, go back. Yeah. Maybe three times. Let's do this again. <laughs> Sorry if this is, I hope I'm not traumatizing anyone with, <laughs> with this imagery. Uh, this is a video that I took at a robotic dairy operation in Woodstock, Ontario. So what we're seeing here is a, is a, um, a robotic arm that is trying to latch onto the teats of a cow. So in a robotic dairy operation, 50 cows, usually no more, are in a barn. The cows wear a radio fre frequency ID tag, sorry microphone, an RFID tag around their, around their necks. And if they feel like they want to be milked because they're all lactating, they approach the, ro the robot. The computer that's running the robot will know by their tag whether they're due to be milked or not, usually twice a day. Um, and it will let them in if they're due to be milked. If they're not due to be milked, the cow is disappointed because there's some really good feed in that, in that robotic uh, area. So a gate will go up, they'll go in, the gate closes. It will actually close to the, um, using sensors, close to the specific size of the cow to kind of trap them in there feed comes out, the cow starts eating, it releases some happy endorphins, and this robotic arm comes up and latches on. It shines uh, um, 
of being through the, through the milk as it's coming out to look for coloration and purities. It tells you how long each teat is in each milking cup, how much milk is being produced, how much feed the cow is eating, how much the cow is moving, because the movement of the cow could indicate that it has some kind of infection, for example. All that data is being churned out and given to the farmer. Farmer doesn't, <laughs> farmer doesn't usually analyze it unless they see something very serious. Lily Robotics will help them analyze it. So what we did with this was we wanted to use it as an opportunity to teach people about the pervasive impact of data on their lives and how data is involved in agriculture in a way that they might not expect. So we had the farmer choose 12 cows and we took that, we call this teat tweet, we put the cows on Twitter. Each one was given a different voice and basically what would happen is whenever a cow approached the, the, the pen, it would start, data would be gathered by the computer. We push that data out into a tweet so it would be embedded in a message that's prefab like, hey human, I just pumped out 2.3 kilograms for your pleasure. Show me some love. Or the robot won't let me into the pen. Somebody help. <laughs> um, but each cow had a different voice. It's a very rudimentary AI. Uh, why do we do this? Um, part of it, as I said, is to show the pervasiveness of data in our lives, but also to think of, Jane just mentioned, more than human, more than human um, entities on the planet. And also to think about data, not in terms of just human or technology in terms of human, but to think about technology impacting the entire planet but also to think about what constitutes the human in the first place. There are people uh, in the world who still aren't considered human, and there are people who were not considered human up until about 50 years ago. And so there are other forms of data we can look at historically. <coughs> people who have tried to demonstrate this, this is W.E.B. Du Bois from the World's Fair in Paris in 1900, um, showing a, a data visualization about black people in the United States. And uh, I'll show some more of those if we're scrolling images, and I think later on, maybe. But the point is that um, data is not all just about digital stuff, and it can not always be really beautiful, but it can actually, it can be very significant, and it can teach us things, critical uh, lessons about the role of technology in our lives. Thank wow. you. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah. So thank you to all the panelists for those introductions. Awesome, right? Wow. Yeah. Okay, all, right. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's <laughs> Do we? She's not letting us go yet. All right. Um, so let's, uh, let's move into a, a little bit more open-ended conversation now. Of course, I'm the moderator, so I'm not just going to turn it over uh, completely, but rather I'll try to pose some leading questions and see how our panelists respond to them. Uh, the first, I think, that I'll start off with Maybe it's, it's the most straightforward question that you would want to ask uh, a, a collection of artists working with data, which is how should data be incorporated into art? And you know, maybe one way to think about that is what do you love to see in art that makes explicit use of data? What do you get excited about in your work or the work of others? And I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing to be completely democratic. Does anybody want to jump in with a hot take? Um, yeah, I, thank you. Uh, um, sure. Um, I think I'm going to equivocate. I, I don't. I, I'm, uh, so, one of the things that I really love is a really fantastic visualization. I think that uh, oftentimes data has a lot of layers to it, and um, well, algorithms can help us sort of pull out, you know, high slope areas and like figure out where the peaks are and so on, and say, look at sample number 972 because that's where the interesting stuff is. Um, there's nothing like a really good visualization of data mm -hmm. um, that I that, that so I get very excited about those. Um, but I also think that it can be really elegant to. Uh, build what are what are sometimes called ambient displays, and so you know we're using a very broad uh, definition of art. But I think, for example, about projects Herman Miller uh, for their Red collection and their in their headquarters in New York City um, built uh, an application that was taking all of the data around sales in different stores around the country and sales of specific products, and they just had sort of ambient lights and shapes projected on the wall in a way that. Um, rendered these sort of mass of data sort of intuitive to the managers who knew how to read it. 
Um, so there's something very elegant about being able to present data in a consumable way. Um, and th but then I also like data that, I also like art that, where the data is just the, the inspiration and not necessarily visualized. So that's where I'm equivocating a little bit. But that's fair. Yeah. I mean, it, I assume we would agree there's a continuum from like the Absolutely. simplest line graph showing, you know, here's the stock price and the most profound work of art that interprets that through many layers. Absolutely. And I think, I think one of the things about the interpretive um, power of art um, is that sometimes the message that the artist wants to send is not so much about, it doesn't come from the data itself. I mean, Marcel, you alluded a little bit to this, right? That the data, data can be nice, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be, but often the role of the artist is to sort of highlight that data, highlight the issue around the data and get, art has a unique ability to get people to consider emotionally and, and um, yeah. I think it's kind of like the framing, yeah. right? Like if it's kind of like with photography, I mean, you can, you, you frame the world that you see and I think that this can be really powerful when an artist frames data in a very particular way and sort of helps tell a story through the use of metaphor. I'm a sucker for a good metaphor. So if I see something really, like a really smart way of handling it, like something that's not too didactic, that sort of puts it in dialogue with larger issues, I think it's really exciting when, some, when an artist could, I think that's the craft, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, at, a, at a low level, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is, is just raw composition, right? Good photography, good painting, the artist has a knack for saying, you, your eye started here, but I want you to come over here. There's, there's something I want you to see here on my on my canvas, and uh, good art can do that for data as well. Can yeah. say here's where the interesting yeah. stuff happens, and I want you to stop and consider it. Right. I, I, I would agree with that, um, especially the connection to larger social issues that you're you're saying. So I think the data art that I like really looks at data that we wouldn't normally have access to, or we wouldn't think of, and it brings it to the fore and it says, look at this, look what's happening. Or it looks at data that that we can't get access to, yeah. like Mimi Onuoha, Brooklyn-based artist. Um, I had her uh, up here in a class I taught here a few years ago, but she has this basically this uh, library of missing data, and it's just a file cabinet with file folders in it. But f the folders are, are things like number of children born to um, mixed race couples or uh, the number of black people who auditioned for roles on Broadway and didn't get the role. Um, things like that, and it's, mm -hmm. it's very abstract. It's not about mathematical data points. It's about you know the stuff that we don't know, the data that we don't have that hasn't been collected. That, that's very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me shift to something that I feel strongly about that uh, I think is related, which is, um, how important is the exact nature of the data for informing what it is you end up doing with it artistically? I mean, uh, in computer graphics, which is one of the things I study, there's uh, a lot of fun, interesting generative art where you, you create some kind of abstract visualization, but usually the visualization is driven purely by randomness. So sure, that is a source of data, but it is almost by definition, a not interesting source of data. It's just pure data for its own sake. How much, uh, how much does it matter that the data is about something? Or ca are you willing to work with any data set as long as the numbers wiggle in a pretty way? It's interesting that, because uh, I talked to my husband about this last night when we were walking the dog, just probing this question and thinking about it. And for me, I think I really, Understanding the data is really important for me, and it helps inform the metaphors that I work with. So for example, uh, with my visualization with all the particulates, um, it's, uh, that's the way the, the size of the particulates have a lot to do with CO2. And so looking at all my data sets, I can see that you know during the night the CO2 levels get higher and higher, and then during the day it gets lower and lower. I think that's mm -hmm. how it goes. And it's so basically, it's kind of every day the forest is taking a single breath. And then I think about my own breath, and I think every time I exhale, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's humid, it's thicker. The air coming out of my mouth is thicker than the air that comes in, which informed why I decided that all the particulates would get juicy, is what I called them. And so they get juicier at night, and then they get really nice and thin during the day. So it's the interpretation and the understanding of that data that helps generate 
my artistic choices yeah. in how I represent the data in this particular visualization because I'm trying to create this this living entity that was made up from all these things that I extracted and then put back together again, right? So for me, I think understanding the data is important, but I don't think it's necessary for every artist, right? I just think for me, right. it's important. Any comments on that? Well, I mean, it's interesting because in the, in the, in the the case of Teat Tweet, for example, it didn't matter whether the cow was pumping out 3.8 kilograms or 2.6. Uh, the point is that the messaging around that is you probably didn't know that a, a, a robot and attached computer apparatus was measuring how much milk a cow was outputting. It doesn't matter how much. But in something like data about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women being integrated into a project, probably matters. Um, <laughs> So it, it really depends on the context. Like, you know, you can, you can plug data into uh, some kind of visualization apparatus and it doesn't matter what the data is, it'll make interesting visuals. Right. But if you're being political about it, it matters where the data comes from. That's true. Yeah. But also think with Teat Tweet though, I mean, it's the fact that this data is being collected. It's yeah. like the reality, yeah. it's the employee, yeah. like, it, that, like just watching the video is very intense. The fact that an animal, this sort of other than human animal is living in a in a context that's very inhumane it feels like it just sort of and then it's getting quantified but we can see the metaphors and how that sort of prolifer pro proliferates uh, outwards well Lily robotics says the cows like it better because there's less interaction with humans the cows milk themselves <laughs> they're like they wander around this barn that and the <laughs> farmer said i don't touch my cows anymore i, I don't know my cows he loved the Twitter thing That's because sad. he's like, suddenly <laughs> this data has brought him closer to his cows. It, it, uh, is, it is a kind of another layer of interpretation of the idea of data and the arts. It, like the T-tweet is more a commentary on data than an artwork that explicitly does something with the data. And in fact, even an even stronger commentary, I think is, the, the, is Mimi's work that you mentioned earlier, right? The library of, of missing data. That is very much about data and the arts, but it is specifically about not having the data. So there's there's no data to visualize. Yeah. I just wonder what would tweet if my <coughs> phone were to tweet out how much data things that I'm doing. If it were to tweet that information out, it just makes me think <laughs> about myself, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, uh, the the artist um, Ed Felton, I think, is his name, a, a artist and designer who used to produce an annual report of himself, and he would keep careful track of all the data he generated throughout a year, every phone call, every interaction, every bowl of cereal, and then he would produce this richly illustrated report at the end of the year. That's what that would be like. A quantified life. Right. Displaying yeah. yourself to the public. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I, I'm happy to use any kind of data, but I think I'd like to be thoughtful about what I do with it. So I think I agree with Marcel that there's certain kinds of data that you want to be respectful of. Absolutely. Um, you know, in, in the pieces that I showed earlier, there's there's all different kinds of uses of data, and even some, you know, the inspiration for the form of Solar Collector, we didn't even anticipate that that was gonna happen, and it was just kind of natural. Um, on the one hand, we are looking at um, a project in the Bay of Fundy that's gonna use real-time tide data to influence the, the movement of the lights on the sculpture. Um, and then you mentioned randomness, and, and I, I think that's there's something really lovely about that because one of the things that we found in the sculptures where we're trying to impart the idea of intelligence of, of um, that, the, that the sculptures are living um, randomness is critically important because otherwise things look deterministic um, yeah. and so you overlay a little bit of randomness on something and all of a sudden it has this more human um, Colin Allard in psychology had a grad student who was uh, trying to study how people assign agency to objects. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a simulation where a ball will fly at you in a VR environment. And if the ball followed a physical trajectory, it was a ball. But if you imposed any kind of movement randomness on that trajectory, all of a sudden it was alive. People would assign agency to it. Um, so that's, that's, that's terrific. Yeah. Other comments on that? All right. Um, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna, I think we already talked let me, let me turn things around just a little bit now and, 
maybe something a little bit closer to uh, Marcel's heart, not to call on you directly, <laughs> feel free to demur. Yeah, sure. But I think in our preliminary discussions in preparation for this, you brought up the term data abstinence, um, at which I think is a great term, right? Sort of yeah. deliberately withdrawing from the deluge of data. So the question for everybody then is, what is the role of data abstinence in contemporary art? And can art help us escape the deluge rather than wallow in it? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, not specifically directed at you, but if you want to take the first Yeah, I mean, I've used, <laughs> I, I taught a course called Digital Abstinence, a grad course, probably five or six times. I was going to write a book called Digital Abstinence. <laughs> I mean, I was raised a Catholic, I'm sorry. Do you teach it uh, online? Or? Uh, <laughs> I, I have taught it online, actually. <laughs> um, and the students started the class by smashing a computer with a sledgehammer yes. and then exploring the implications of that. Ridiculous. Um, I, I shy away from the word abstinence for a number of reasons now. I was using it ironically. I actually like to co-opt uh, ritualistic elements of the Catholic Church. I've done performances about this. You can look it up if you want. It's weird. Um, <laughs> but I think the, the idea of data abstinence to me is, is interesting to think about because it's impossible. <laughs> it is Im from, you know, bef even before you're born, data is being gathered about you. And I wrote about this in uh, mm -hmm. a book called Necromedia. Uh, and it's but just the experience of my child in a womb already being, you know, there's data already being gathered about the child. The gender is inscribed on a screen. And as soon as you see that M-A-L-E on the screen, you're immediately starting to project the future of that child and to project your assumptions onto that child. So that data, I mean, that happens before you're born. They, you can't escape. You can't be data abstinent. Um, you know, you go to Tim Hortons. <laughs> you think you're, you think you know you're. No one's collecting data on you. Well, you're using an app, so maybe that's not fair. But anyway, I, I I like to think of it as, I mean, is it even possible? What would it look like to live without allowing anyone to collect data about you? Um, I'm talking about digital data here. We can, you know, yeah. And, <laughs> and everyone else is like, we don't want to talk about that. I don't, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> But what about like, <coughs> you know, should we be creating artworks that allow us to withdraw from the data somehow? What would that, would, is there anything that that is specifically or is that just a painting, right? Or an empty canvas? Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, leave your phone at home and go to an art gallery. Um, yeah. But there'll be security cameras there yes. taking your pictures. So <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. I was, I was thinking, I mean, there was a, an artist recently who was commissioned by a, uh, a museum, I think it was in, I want to say Denmark, to produce artworks, and he just gave them empty canvases. And I think they were entitled to take the money and run, mm -hmm. which, was, which was great. And that, you know, I would go, I would go and contemplate those empty canvases as a, as a break from the everyday deluge. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, then, uh, if, we're, uh, if we're moving on, then let's, uh, let's turn to the future, uh, the unknowable future, but uh, it's always interesting to contemplate where we go with this topic, with uh, the interaction between data and art. So um, what, what do you foresee, and maybe more importantly, what would you like to see? What do you hope to see about, uh, in the interaction between data and art in the future? Is it going to be new kinds of data, new kinds of art with existing data, new kinds of interactions between them, or something else? I don't know how to answer that question without going to Dali. <laughs> you said you didn't Dali, Dali go too. To Dali. You can, no, you can. Go I, I, there, go there. We didn't want to completely Just deconstruct the, the, the right. modern AI art movement. Um, you, can see, you can tell us how to do it. So about there's, that. so, um, uh, Craig referred earlier to a, a series of AI algorithms that are increasingly becoming intelligent, well, becoming able to uh, produce creative works in, 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 in response to a text prompt. Yeah. Um, and this has spawned a whole, and the, the part of the reason I want to talk about these is that um, on the one hand, you know, like a lot of other things, we can look at that and say that's the death of the artist, you know, where it's, it's the death of creativity. Um, on the other hand, I think, Jay, you shared recently Ken Rinaldo's um, post. He's a, an American artist. Um, and he's collaborating with Dali. 
right? He's like feeding Dali prompts, Dali feeds him back images, he takes those images and improves them, he digitizes yeah. them, works on them in Illustrator, feeds more prompts into Dali. And so there's, there's a really interesting uh, collaborative aspect to that. Um, this, this prompt based creative act is not just happening in art. Um, so there's a, there's a specialized program called Midjourney, right. which is similar, and its, its purpose is to create architecture. Um, and we're looking at the same thing happening in software, where you'll be able to take a, a text prompt and have it generate code for you. Um, so we're designing buildings by speaking to a computer, and we're designing art by speaking to a computer, and we're designing software by speaking to a computer. And it's given rise to a whole field called prompt engineering because you have yeah. to actually be pretty good at creating these prompts to get what you want out of it. So the technology is not there yet, but it's super fascinating to see. And I, I foresee, like think going down that road, I foresee it as a tool that experts will learn to, uh, to take advantage of and to use like Ken is doing in the art world and like some architects are doing with Midjourney now. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where. I mean, that's that's one direction that I think sure. that data goes in the future. Data and art. Yeah. I mean, it's worth it's worth saying uh, uh, these algorithms. Uh, the data here is the just simply gargantuan amount of data that is fed into these algorithms in order to train them. Right. The, something like Midjourney is trained on hundreds of thousands or millions of images, and in fact. The next generation of tools that people have released are search engines to allow you to check if your images are in that data set informing the outputs that these algorithms are creating. For our part in CS, I know some of my colleagues are a little bit scared about the automated coding systems from prompts. Like, is this, you know, never mind the, is this the end of the artist? Is this the end of the CS undergrad student yeah. who will just, you know, type in, give me the answer to this question? Or is it the end of the patient who's you know, right. cancer treatment has driven by <laughs> prompt generated software. <laughs> right. yeah, Jimmy yeah. had a few things to say about that too. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of it is, it's like these data sets that are being curated, they're, they're training these, 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 these AIs. I think this is, I mean, when, when artists are participating, I think what's really important to me at least is that the artist is taking the, the algorithm, they're taking the, the, the technologies and they're modifying them, they're putting in different relationships to each other, they're creating, the, the unpacking complexity in interesting ways, they're creating their own metaphors to critically rethink how these tools are being used. I think in a lot of ways, what I wanna see artists doing is I wanna see them get more and more literate in technology. Yeah. I wanna see them being able to write their own algorithms, to be able to really critically engage and sort of offer the other side of the pendulum because it's these are these technologies are not neutral we all know that and also we need people to propose new possible ways of thinking about technology and i think that's kind of what the artist's job is, is to sort yeah. of poke at a problem and to say well i propose something different and i want to see artists doing that and that's why i think it's important to have like the program that i'm teaching yeah. in computational arts it's half computer science and engineering and fine arts and we want our students to be literate, 100% literate in both of the, well, it can never be 100% literate when it's interdisciplinary because it's really hard to become excellent at a, at a lot of things. But at the same time, I think it's really essential to have somebody other than, you know, industry coming up with these technologies and, and deploying them in the world and to sort of put them into different contexts and to shift and shift how we think about them and to point fingers at what's actually happening. Yeah. Way. I, I, yeah, I think that's all great. Yeah. Um, I like to think about you know the current context of AI generated um, art in the context of Photoshop in to to architects um, yeah. twenty years ago. I remember at the University of Detroit teaching architecture cl class classes to architects, and there were some old school architects there who were like, these students shouldn't be using Photoshop, and they shouldn't be using these new 3D CAD things that they're working with. They should be drawing these things and learning how to use a ruler and a, and a pencil. And it's, it's really all about co-creation. It's about co-creation with the tools. An AI generating, an art generating <laughs> AI engine is a tool. Yeah. And sure, it'll generate art all day and some people will call it art. And I can get to that in a minute, but um, 
It's really about the co-creation between uh, a human being, currently, a yeah. human being and that thing. That context can change. I mean, the yeah. Impressionists were kept out of the salon, yeah. right? Because that was not art. Um, so it's all about the changing context, Jane, Jane mentioned. Like you, if the context for what is art changes and we accept non-human, and we haven't really accepted animal, non-human animal art, are we gonna accept non-human machine art maybe maybe but like i don't know i just i feel like people are making machines like they we're feeding them data i mean like i I, the, I showed you guys the um, the um the artworks from the electra festival from 2016 machines making machine making art for machines and and so you'd have all these uh, one of them was there was all these machines that were trained on expressionistic type pencil drawings right. and so you'd sit down and all these robotic arms would start looking at you and drawing you and you'd walk away with all these beautiful images why isn't that like it's gorgeous and it's interesting because it's really about this machine that's doing an interpretation based on how it was trained and so these images are filtered through so much information and then you've got 20 of them as these 20 different machines interpret you differently and, and that that in itself is a fascinating artwork or the, there was one robotic arm that wrote out the Bible over the whole show in beautiful well, calligraphy. But like these are interesting pieces in my but mind. But isn't the art in the design of those things? The art right. is in the coding and architecture of those uh -oh. machines. It's not that the machines are making art, it's someone made those That's machines. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like an artist is still working with this. Like this yes. is not like okay. the artist yeah. isn't implicated. The art, like right. this machine wouldn't do it on its own. We agree. Know? Yeah, no, exactly. Yes. <laughs> right. yeah, this is, this is the so I don't, I don't understand the argument, I guess, is what I'm saying, sorry. That, no, I was just gonna say, there just a reference to, you know, mid 20th century artist Saul LeWitt, who was about like, right. okay, I'm gonna, you know, it's, a, it's about the act of creation is not in the act of execution, they're, they're separate. Um, and so he would write out instructions, and so you can see a Saul LeWitt wall painting number 72 in multiple places, and they'll all be different. Um, and the, the original creation is the set of instructions that are given to various sets of executors. Um, and so this is, this is kind of similar to that, you know, like it's like who's writing the code. Yeah, um, Kent Monkman, um, indigenous artist uh, who has a show coming up at, um, at the ROM actually, um, of all places, which is really interesting. That is interesting. He has a team of artists. This is, this is basically Renaissance style, but he, he has a, a, a vision, he sets up models, takes photos, and he kind of sketches things out, and a team of artists make these incredible, incredible paintings, tableau. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it's kind of similar in that he's giving a set of instructions, and they're executing it, and then you get this thing, and it's like, wow, that thing's beautiful. Did Kent Monkman make the right. thing? Because he gets still Ish. got to play the role of the artist. Yeah. But that's yeah. a problem of the art world, right? Because yeah. the art world likes <laughs> to create their little genius and say, this is the artist, right? And then meanwhile, there's it's like the like a director of a film. Like you don't have a film without a cinematographer. So it's really a complex system of people all working together on a vision. Sure. And so I have a real hard time with this sort of, I, like a lot of these works are very collaborative and there's many, many very talented human beings involved in that collaboration. So I think that's yeah. an art world problem. Yep, that's fair. You know, yeah. no, no mid-journey produced painting just emerged out of the void all at once. It rests on an enormous amount of technology, mathematics, images by human artists over you know, however many years. Yeah. And so to your original uh, point about mid-journey and, and about the algorithms that are allowing you, the search engines allowing you to find your images, you know, with the, with the living architecture work that we do, those are massive projects with yeah. hundreds of thousands of individual hand-assembled pieces in them. And there's an army of volunteers and studio interns and everybody, and they're all credited. Um, but, you know, how far do you go? Do you, do you go back and just, you know, does an image generated by Midjourney need to credit all of the original photographers of the original images? Yeah, yeah, yeah like, you know. Maybe fractional yeah. credits, depending on. Maybe, the yes, <laughs> si font size or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. All right. How are we, are we doing for we're time? There's a timer here, but it keeps resetting itself, so I'm not really <laughs> sure how to read it. Should we wrap yeah. things up? Yeah. yeah. So. So uh, in that case, let's, yeah, let's move into uh, questions. I, I think, is everybody, are, are the live audience members supposed to submit their questions electronically as well? Right, so we have the slides, but it's just. Yeah. 
hey, over there. What are you? <laughs> And I'll just repeat the question into the microphones and out <laughs> into the data-driven world. But I'll, I'll start right there because I see a question on the screen that I like. So uh, I'm interested in how you choose the visual expression of the data. I mean, among all the possible ways to turn a piece of data into art, how do you pick what you do? Ooh. Oh, okay. Yeah, that definitely is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Deer in a headlight, what? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it's a lot has to do with um, looking at, like I'm working with a lot of different sensors and I'm, I have a lot of, I do a lot of reading, a, a lot of thinking about sort of how do these sense, like what, what is this thing that I'm trying to sense? You know, how is it, I don't know, I, there's just trying to get to the, the meat of what this thing is. Um, and I think for me, I, I started to work with particulates in the air, that was one thing that became the way I was thinking, and I was also thinking, I've been working with dendrochronologists, so dendrochronology is uh, the, uh, you can actually date a tree by taking a core sample, and then you can, uh, using isotopes, you can analyze each of the tree rings and you can get climate data, so trees literally are records of history, like they, uh, they have this, this long history, and, and so I, I'm working in all these different areas, I'm reading different books, and then there's just something that captures me, usually. Yeah. Um, and in this case, I was working with dendrochronologists, and I kept on thinking about the animacy hierarchy, uh, something that, um, oh, I forgot, uh, Kim Talbert talks about, which is uh, those that seem, that deem to be not alive are lower on the hierarchy than things that are alive, and thinking about trees are often considered, like, while they're living, maybe they're not alive or they're not sentient, and thinking about, like, the different, time scales that we have. And so then I start to think about how do I create a visualization that forces the human to slow down and the tree to yeah. speed up. And then, you know, then I'm working with tree rings and then it all just comes together. I, I can't quite explain, like that's a hard question to answer because there's a lot of things that come together right. that help me find my metaphor but and then I move with it. But let me ask, I mean, maybe related to this, uh, is, this act, is this question particular to data? Or is this a, just an art question? How do you choose to express anything mm -hmm. as a piece of art? <laughs> <laughs> what he said, yeah. yeah no, I mean, yeah. but also just like data. I mean, it's how, that's what the artist's job is, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think about how Marcel is handling data versus how you have been handling it in, in, your, in your installations. We're all sort of what are the things that are, we're most passionate about and whether it's the political aspects of the collection of the data or are we trying to create these living architectural systems that are expressing the liveliness of living entities? I mean, there's all the data, but then there's these politics and these other umbrellas that we're, we're imaging that data w uh, underneath or within. So I feel it's like all those other things, and then we think about the data, and then you start to express it. So for me, it filters through intellectual and emotional and all these other levels before we make that choice as artists. Uh, but when you when you find that that connection, the then right that's, then you're like then I you know it, right? <laughs> yeah, you're ready. Yeah, you know it, and it it's like the it. hard part's over, and then it's the mad matter of sort of following it to its most logical conclusion. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So what is it? Let's see. I'm just one to myself. Okay. What do you believe? <laughs> you're, this is great. Why don't I'm you're just not the moderator? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not the moderator. You're not the can, can you read it? You're not the moderator of me. That's right. <laughs> 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 What do you believe is the most promising or exciting use case for data and art slash social good? So how can data-driven art help us produce social good? Um, <laughs> is this for me? I'm talking I, I, I can give a I quick answer if you want. Sure, go ahead. I, I, think you're gonna answers, go, I think you're going to go deeper. But, um, I mean, I think this is, this is a question about any kind of art, really. Uh, I think that um, one of the roles of the artist in terms of political and social commentary and helping people is to help people think differently about stuff. Um, whether that's, you know, you're doing 
biological art by growing cancer cells and then ceremoniously killing them with radiation or like wh whatever it might be. Um, that's a specific example yeah. from Isaiah 2006. Um, whatever it might be, it's to draw attention to something in a context where people are not expecting that to happen and thereby hope that for them to think differently about whatever it is. So in this case, it's the data. Um, and so I think you know one of the most promising uses of, of data for social good is just that artists have access to data that uh, that that um, that that deserves critique, that deserves to be analyzed and critiqued and, and sort of highlighted. So. That's what I would have said, Rob. <laughs> what, he, what he said. No, I I mean I I they're asking for a use case, and I want to yeah. give them a use case. Um, it's really hard. There's so many possible examples, and I won't even remember the names of all the, the artists, but there is an arts group who during COVID did a really interesting visualization of, um, of black people in the United States dying of COVID. And they visualized the, the comparative data analysis of, um, of race and sickness, illness, and deaths from COVID. Amazing. But they have access to that data, and I think that's what's so exciting is the kind of move to toward transparency and the, all the like tech for good stuff that I was showing up there is people wanting to know what's happening to their data. I guess if Tim Horton's taking it, they don't care. We can Canadians don't care what's happening. I mean, Loblaws is taking all your data. They own your health data, your banking data. You know, it's crazy. Um, but I think that there is a move to make all of that transparent. That's what's exciting. And then that can be used by artists to say, okay, let's look at this data we have now let's visualize it or represent it in an in, in interesting way that will get people's attention, get them to think about it. And to me, that's exciting, is the ability to, to, find, to see that stuff, yeah. But there's, there's a flip side. With this next question came up at the perfect yeah. moment to, uh, to counteract that. So I, I wanna go right into this because I think it's great. Um, with transparency comes potentially the, the death of privacy. Right, the more uh, in so possibly right. So, what is the role of, of the privacy of data when you are turning it into art? And uh, in a you know the specific question here as well, which is particularly frightening, is can visualized publicly available art be reverse engineered? So, if somebody creates an artwork, can I then extract the information about the individuals whose data went into making that? Rob, you had a student who did an interesting an exhibition we co-curated at Communitech, a student who had a, a kiosk set up and you, you went to the kiosk, you filled out some information, remember? Or you no. played a game or no, something? <laughs> and that, and as you were doing <laughs> that, you didn't realize, but you were being, your image was being recorded and you were being tracked and your oh, image yes. got projected onto another sc screen somewhere else in the building. That's right. Um, I mean, that's not the best it's example. Not the same. Yeah, it's not really but I think that I think the point is that um, the <laughs> is that our, our our data is being is being collected, and that yeah. the point of a lot of this art is to show that our privacy is is under attack. So I can't think of an example of an artwork. like art based on that demonstrates surveillance culture. Uh, I mean, sure. there's lots. I've seen yeah. lots of great examples, but I couldn't tell you one specific. Yeah. I mean, that was that was that was one. That was that was exactly what it was. Is you would you would arrive in a room. There was a kiosk. It asked you to key in your sort of. Uh, I don't remember. I don't think they asked for names, um, but it was like, do you agree to enter this space or something? And I think there was some fine print that nobody ever reads that told them that. You know, <laughs> Um, and then they went around a corner, and there was a Christie Microwiles tall, or Micro Tiles wall, um, that had all of the images taken of them agreeing to the thing. And, <laughs> and you know, had they read the fine print, which we don't, um, but that was exactly the point: is, is that you know yeah. we are being surveilled. Um, I think I think to the second question there, yeah, it's a, it's it's tricky to imagine a visualization of a complex data set. That could be reverse engineered, um, to, to me, anyways, and I, I'm, I'm simply because it's there's so many possible ways to analyze data and produce visuals, you know, two D visuals out of a large yeah. data set. That it would, I think, it would be very difficult to reverse engineer. <laughs> and I know that there's like questions about the ethics of storing data uh, when you are working with people 
like say uh, there's a lot of students uh, that, there's a, a colleague of mine, Mark David Hosell, who's working with biometrics and he's developing all these body sensors. And we've got a bunch of students who are working with this data and it's live collected data. And so there's a lot of discussion about how do we handle that data, like what's the right way of handling the data. And so a lot of the students that I've been working with aren't actually storing anything because they don't, they don't feel comfortable with holding on to that information be for these types of reasons. Um, and I think it's a question that we have, we have discussions about because I, it, it is worth thinking about. Um, I don't necessarily have, um, I don't have any examples of this actually happening, but I mean, I do think it's worth thinking about. I, I will say from a computer science perspective, uh, you know, for example, in our data science program, uh, whenever you process large volumes of potentially private data, this question always arises. Is there's always a risk of reverse engineering information about individuals from aggregate data that you're trying to analyze. And so, in fact, there's a lot of active research in computer science related to scrubbing uh, data to make sure that you can still do meaningful computations with it, but in such a way that it does not reveal any individual's private information. And, and I mean, it's not anything I work on, but it's a fascinating topic because you want to, in some ways, preserve all the information in the data while scrambling it just enough that no individual's personal information can be extracted from that. Yeah. And it's not obvious that you can do that at all, but there are some nice projects that do it. I'll pause and look out into the crowd. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to keep going here. If you are, like, texting us, I mean, if anything, that's all the more appropriate for the <laughs> yeah, event tonight. Do something so with all this data. Thank you. Don't yeah, we are going to, yeah, we're, it's going to appear back here. Um, oh, what, what, what? So I, I guess this is a question for each individual. What are the limits to your work with data and art? And what needs to happen to remove those limits? So are there places where you're stuck? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, my, <laughs> this is there's not a limitation on the data. Well, it is. <laughs> You're keeping Sorry. your lanyard on. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Um, no, big fuzzy sweater. I don't know what it is. Anyways. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, it's because my microphone fell down my shirt. Hello. <laughs> just talk down your shirt. Yeah. <laughs> just talk to your shirt. <laughs> is that is that art? This is what my data. I'm just performing art. Anybody else have an answer? Well, I, you guys can shut me off. To me, the limits are what I was talking about earlier, is, is getting more data to be accessible. I want to know what kind of data, you know, Loblaws is tracking about me every time I use my PC Optimum card <laughs> and how they're using that data. I want to know what every website I go to, every cookie is tracking. I mean, it will make you paranoid to find out. And we don't, a lot of people don't want to know or they don't care, but I'm interested. I want to know. I want to see that visualization of not me gather, you know, gathering my own data, writing it out, and, and tallying my phone calls and so on. I want to see the global data visualization yeah. of my life right now and what's being collected and why. Your footprint. Yeah. yeah. Your data footprint. Yeah. And that's not accessible. And I think, I think it should be for crazy people who want to see it. <laughs> I think it should be. You should be able to very easily say, I want to see everything that Loblaws has on me right now. Yeah. Do we are do moving in that direction, yeah. uh, you know, legally, uh, at least in some places yeah. in the world. Yeah. 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 I mean, Europe is, Europe is <laughs> way ahead of us on that. Um, Google has, you, you can go to Google and you can get a pretty good report. Um, you don't know how complete it is, of course, <laughs> but it's detailed, detailed enough to make you go, oh, okay, that's all you have, and then. <laughs> um, the limits of data, uh, for me, in our work, um, is the data collection side. Uh, so if anybody out there has a company that's making really good, non-invasive, non-line of sight, lightweight, precise, interior localization technologies, and you want to partner, <laughs> let me know. That's just figuring out where someone is. So that's the limit of data, yeah. yeah. Figuring out where they are in the room. That's uh, the limit. Another, uh, I mean, another standard technological problem when working with mountains of data is sanitizing it so that you can clean up the things that are going to break your algorithm and whip it into shape so every part of it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had how much you've had to deal with that. That's a, 
another common problem in downloading some big data set out in the world. It always has glitches in it that you have mm. to work around. Mm. Do you, do you have, how clean is your data coming off your sensor? Well, I think my limitation actually are the sensors, <laughs> I think, to a certain extent. I can't, well, first of all, I'm using ESPs to process or to send the data. And a lot of the, the, date, the sensors that I'm using are cheaper sort of maker sensors. And so I can get good particulate counts and I can get decent fidelity, but it's not really, really high fidelity. And I also can't get the detail that I want. Like, for example, trees have something like 15 sensory receptors. I want to be able to actually sense all those 15 sensory receptors so that like those different types of phenomena so I can actually understand sort of how the tree sees the world and I don't have access to that type of that type of sensor. So I mean my limitation is the technologies that are cheap enough for me to use that I can afford and I'm also uh, up against my own ignorance <laughs> like I'm not an engineer so I can, I only know how to do so much when it comes to programming, and so yeah, my limitations are myself, my own brain, and the technology. Yeah. So everything. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I was going to say. What needs to happen to remove these limits? I need to get a PhD in math. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Obviously. I, I kind of want to get a PhD right. in engineering. Yeah, I need an art degree. So <laughs> I I, I'll give you one quick example of sanitizing data. I had a project. I I, I haven't said anything about my stuff, so I feel like I should. Okay. One thing. One thing. I had a project where I took a data set consisting of all of Trump's tweets, um, and I remixed them to randomly generate haikus based on, based on his tweets. Um, but that's, I mean, that's immensely difficult because, of course, his tweets are a garbled mess. And so how do you extract, uh, in particular, how do you even know how many syllables things are? Because you need, haiku is 575, right? So in some, like, the word kofefe, how many <laughs> syllables is that? Well, I had to add that to my data set because that's not an English word. And when he said four digits, is that a year? If so, how many syllables does it contain when you pronounce it in English? So that I could make sure that I got a real haiku when the process was finished. So the data set is very messy and a lot of technological work is necessary to, uh, to whip it into shape so that it gives you the results you want. For my part though, I mean, Given the nature of that project, you might guess what I need is an art degree. So <laughs> I, I, I sympathize with, with uh, the two of you. Um, so I guess wrap that, it up. that's, that's, that's like the subtle message that we. <laughs> that's not a question, wrap that's up. a statement. Wrap up? Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, I guess, uh, I guess it's time to wrap things up. So before I, 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 I say thank you and, and, and good night, I, let me just give you an opportunity if any of you have any final things you want to say just by chance that you want to get off your chest. If not, no worries, but, uh, well, well, yeah, you only want, you want to get your mic off yeah. your chest, <laughs> but now you're ready <laughs> to go. That happened already. Apparently. Yeah, that happened already. Well, so in that case, um, I'll just, uh, let me start, I'll, I'll thank the, the three of you, uh, Rob, Jane, and Marcel, because this is great, and it's been a lot of fun to have all of you in one place so we could all pick each other's brains and I could hear your feelings on this. And I, I want to thank the organizers of the event for having us here, because this was a lot of fun to do. And thank everybody here in the room and out there on the internet for tuning in. Uh, I hope you had a fun time and learned something new. Thanks for coming. <laughs> There's a little bit of music playing. Um, I will do the official formal wrap-up. Uh, so I'd like to thank you as well, Craig, and to each of you um, on the panel, thank you for your very insightful talk. I think um, just bringing to life the many forms of data, uh, or data, that's also I noticed it. <laughs> is it data or is it data? But, um, and just how, it, really how it can influence art how it enables us to think about data in such a different way. So I really, I really appreciate the talk, and thank you again to everyone for coming. I think it's just a really great example of uh, how it enables us to think differently about things and how these events can bring us together to do that. Um, so a recording of the session will be available on the Alumni Learning website, which will be out shortly after the event. There will also be details about that in our follow-up email. Um, and it will also invite you to share your ideas about future events and your feedback about this one. 
um, and you know other ways that we can work together to build this Waterloo community. Um, I'd also like to give a special thank you to our affinity partner for supporting this event, um, the whole series actually, so that's TD Insurance. Um, Corrado is here, I actually just, see. oh there he is. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, University of Waterloo alumni can enjoy preferred rates on car, home, condo, and tenant insurance through the TD Insurance Maloche Monarchs program. And if you haven't already connected with Corrado, you can do so um, tonight for more information. And you can also always find details about the partnership on our University of Waterloo alumni website. Um, so we also have a few uh, business card draws for those of you who are in the room. Uh, and you can just meet with the team over uh, where you checked in at the start. So um, the first winner is uh, Karen Bose Anand. There, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> uh, we also have our second winner is Margaret Gissing. <laughs> um, and our third winner is Jen Conkle. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Um, and. I think that is everything. Uh, so we hope to see you again for the final series, uh, in final event in the series, Data and Diversity, uh, where we'll discuss how ethical data governance is changing the face of Canada's institutions. Uh, and we're just working on the date still on that one, but that'll come very soon. Um, but other than that, uh, thank you again to everyone for coming, to our speakers, and we'll hope we hope to see you at the next one. <laughs>